All right. Well, with that, again, another welcome on behalf of the Daytona Regional Chamber. It is absolutely my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, our chairman of the board, Bob Lloyd from Brown and Brown. Bob, it's yours. Thank you very much, Nancy, and thank you to all of, uh, of you out there that are joining us. We have a, an exceptional lineup and a presentation, and so for those of you who uh, paid to participate, you are going to get your money's worth and then some. Um, so we are really appreciative to our panel for this Washington Tallahassee Speaker Series. Uh, today's topic is the outlook for business issues before Congress and the Florida Legislature in 2021. Uh, so the November 3rd election was the only the beginning of the process in deciding the makeup of Congress. Uh, we have a runoff in, in Georgia. Uh, we still have some moving pieces and parts, uh, but it is uh, more determined uh, and solidified in the Florida legislature. But what does it all mean for our business community and the issues that face um, our local business community every single day, stimulus, taxes, housing, healthcare, business regulations, tourism, and on and on. Uh, so many of these issues are going to be decided in Washington and Tallahassee, and they'll be done by House and Senate committees and business leaders want to know who will determine uh, these committee agendas and what does that mean for our local economy. So lots on the agenda, lots on the frontier and in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, you know, it adds a little bit of uh, additional mystery to the, the whole equation. So uh, at this time, we have some, uh, I'd like to recognize some special guests and I always, this is the uh, tricky part for any moderator, especially in a virtual environment, because inevitably you're gonna miss someone. Uh, and so to avoid uh, the consternation and the follow-up phone calls, um, what I'm going to do right now is recognize that we have several state and federal staff members of elected officials with us today. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. We also have a few uh, local uh, officials that are with us. And again, we want to thank you uh, for your public service, especially during these tumultuous days. So we appreciate having you on. And um, now I'd like to move into our sponsor recognition. You know, our sponsors make this happen. Um, they are very generous in going above and beyond to help uh, bring relevant and meaningful programs to our members and our community. So our first sponsor, and I'm gonna turn it over to him, is from AT&T. Please welcome Kevin Craig. Thanks, Bob. Uh, AT&T is always honored to sponsor the Washington Tallahassee Speaker Series. Uh, always a lot of great topics every year. Uh, we're really excited for today's conversation on state and national business issues, and we're really blessed to be living here in the nation's best state for doing business. And uh, a lot of that is because of the great leaders we have in Tallahassee, like Rep. Renner uh, and a lot of his colleagues, uh, but also our great chamber partners. And I, every time I do one of these, I have to tip my cap to Nancy and Jim and the whole chamber team because they really are the best in the chamber business at connecting members with our elected officials, uh, allowing that great information sharing that really leads to positive outcomes, not just for our businesses, but our communities as a whole. So I wanna thank Nancy and Jim and the chamber team and Bob for your great leadership on the board. And uh, thank you all for allowing AT&T to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, our next sponsor is Teledyne Marine and please welcome Scott McGuire. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I, I just want to echo you know what Kevin said. It's a pleasure to be one of the sponsors for such a great program. Yeah, 2020 has been a year unlike any other, and you know Teledyne has been fortunate. We've been able to operate throughout the pandemic, but uh, as you look around the nation and see what some businesses are are faced with, you know it's a, it's just a it's a blessing to be in Florida and have leaders that strike that balance between taking things uh, very seriously, but also recognizing people have to make a living. So I'm uh, looking very much forward to the program today and we're happy to be a sponsor and appreciate very much the great work the chamber does on our behalf every year. Thanks, Scott. And uh, our next sponsor, last but not least, uh, Daytona Beach News Journal, please welcome Jamie Brown. Good afternoon, everybody. 
so great to be here as well. Um, is there feedback or is that just me? I think you're good. Okay, good, good. Sorry about that. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I'm Jamie Brown, Regional Marketing and Events Director with uh, Gannett Media, part of the USA Today Network um, and locally known as the Daytona Beach News Journal. We've been a proud sponsor of our local chamber for I believe over 30 years. Um, so super uh, proud of our partnership with the chamber and I, and I echo your comments, uh, Nancy Kiefer and her team, you guys are incredible and it's always a pleasure to be a part of these wonderful conversations. Um, the Daytona Beach News Journal, like I said, is part of uh, the Gannett Network now. So a lot of changes happening um, across the country for our organization, um, but we remain uh, focused on our local and national content uh, for me personally, I live in Ormond Beach, so always interested in what's happening here in my backyard and, of course, what's happening with our state. Definitely proud to live here in Florida during these trying times. Um, but just thank you so much uh, for all that you do. The Chamber is, a, is an amazing organization, and we uh, really, really appreciate the partnership and looking forward to today's program. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and now we'll move into some of the program logistics and um, I wanna just point out at the bottom of the screen, in case any of you have not used Zoom during this pandemic, which I can't even imagine, but anyway, uh, if you look down at the bottom, you will see the chat um, icon. And if you click on that chat icon, you can submit questions and they will be answered in the order that they're submitted. Um, and uh, so please uh, use that. Otherwise I have to fill that time with my own questions and you don't want that. Uh, so let's, um, let's work through it. Now I wanna um, say it's a special, pres uh, it's a, a pleasure for me and a privilege to introduce by video two presenters who have actually um, already been with our chamber once this year during this incredible year that we've had. Um, and uh, to have the second visit and presentation from our two U.S. Senators is really a, a quite a, um, a, a privilege. So the first is from Senator Rick Scott, who serves on the Committee for Aging, Armed Services, Budget, Commerce, Science and Transportation, Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committees. Uh, and the second will be from Senator Marco Rubio, who chairs the Small Business and Intelligence committees and serves on the appropriations and foreign relations committees. Uh, you'll recall that we made some comments that uh, Senator Rubio is not a big favorite in China right now and is on their naughty list. Uh, so he will not be getting anything but coal uh, for Christmas in his stocking. But um, uh, we are so privileged to have these two uh, top notch leaders in our Senate. And um, right now, Nancy, I will turn it over to you for the video presentations. I can't hear anything. I don't know if anybody else can. <laughs> I'm not hearing it either. Nancy. God, first, I'd like to thank you all for your work to continue Florida's economic success. Your efforts have helped so many Floridians keep their jobs and support their families during this very difficult time. Right now in Washington, we're working to support individuals and businesses hurting from the pandemic while making sure taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. I'm also working to include my no budget, no pay amendment in any budget negotiations. My proposal simply says that if Congress cannot work together to fund the government, they should not be getting paid. I'm honored to be your partner in Washington as we continue to fight to make sure our families and businesses can succeed. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's, it's Marco Rubio. Um, I'm honored here to serve on, as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to address the Daytona Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm sorry it's not in person, uh, but next year. But uh, look, your tireless advocacy and support for the Volusia County small business community is, is critical, and I don't think it's ever mattered more than it does right now. 
uh, with a pandemic. The, the COVID-19 pandemic, I don't need to tell you, has devastated communities and countries for that matter all across the uh, globe. But, but no part of our economy, I think, has been hit harder than small businesses and more importantly, the millions of Americans who own them and who are employed by them. It upended traditional business models completely and it's threatened to close permanently these small businesses that up until a week before the pandemic really hit were thriving, in many cases having one of the best years in their history. I can't tell you the countless stories I've heard from owners of small businesses who have had to innovate their business to meet this changing landscape and to continue to provide dignified work for the people that work with them and, and for them. And so I, like many of you, have, have welcomed the news of success in our development of a vaccine. That's tremendous news. Uh, it sounds like we're going to have three vaccines available faster than any vaccines have ever been available before. And so we have real reason to believe that better days are going to be ahead for us, that by sometime next summer, we're going to be in a much different place and it's going to get progressively better. But not surprisingly, many small business owners are also sharing this optimism. And one recent survey, 83 percent of small businesses expected a better 2021 than 2020, which you know, it's hard to have uh, two years like that. The 2020 has been an unusual year to say the least. So I'm optimistic because I've seen the strength and the ingenuity of our nation's small businesses and our entrepreneurs and their ability to adapt. I've also been very encouraged by the success of the historic Paycheck Protection Program, which we designed and, and helped uh, the administration to implement. It pro provided a lifeline to over 5 million small businesses and by some projections saved as many as 55 million jobs. That's a lot of jobs, including in Florida. At the start of the pandemic, I was proud to work with my colleagues over a very short period of time to write it, enact it into law. And I believe without a doubt, it was the single most successful part of the CARES Act. And I've since that time, as I pointed out earlier, I've worked closely with the Trump administration, including the SBA and Treasury to address the myriad of challenges in implementing it create a new program like that that's never existed before to help that many people. You can only imagine there are going to be hiccups along the way, but we were very engaged and many of you were out there providing us input that we were able to share with the administration. The result is that as the latest numbers tell us, 432,000 Floridians have been approved for PPP loans. That's worth more than $32 billion that were pumped into our economy. In Volusia County alone, more than 8,000 businesses got a PPP loan. But even as uh, public health restrictions have continued to ease, we know that there are industries such as hospitality and tourism that continue to have a very, very difficult year. That's followed by questions on when is more relief coming. So 2020 may be coming to an end, but the economic disruption caused by the pandemic has a long tail. It's far from over. And that's why I'm working very hard every single day to ensure that our nation's most vulnerable businesses, including our smallest businesses and those that are located in underserved communities, are able to access the critical lifeline of an additional round of PPP assistance. I helped ensure that 30 billion of the PPP funding we previously approved was set aside for community financial institutions who have played a key role in getting federal funds to underserved, hard hit communities. In addition, you know, that 70% of PPP loans went to our nation's smallest businesses, meaning those with 10 employees or fewer. Uh, PPP has been a, uh, a success story. However, many small businesses are not yet in the clear. They still need more relief. And that's why we're working, even as I speak to you now, I, we are working to continue to find a way to pass with my colleagues additional small business relief as soon as possible. Many members of this chamber have been or can easily imagine themselves in a situation where you've received a PPP loan, you spent the money, you stayed alive and afloat, but now that money's gone and the customers haven't returned and there's still uncertainty in the months ahead in that bridge between now and the vaccine. And without additional support, the only options left for many are going to be to lay off workers or to frankly just close the doors of the business forever. So I think it's clear that we need a second round of PPP to get many of our small businesses through this pandemic and to the other side. Uh, this program enjoys a strong bipartisan support. The second round, I, I believe, shouldn't be held hostage as part of a complex deal. If we can do a big deal, that's great. But if we can't, we should at least do this. It should be passed now. I think it's that straightforward and that simple. The, the phase four package that I proposed, along with Senator Collins of Maine, would provide a second round of loans for those businesses struggling most with the pandemic. And it also included additional funding to help minority-owned small businesses. It includes eligibility for certain 501c6 nonprofits, including chambers of commerce, 
because I think they're going to be critical in continuing to help expand economic opportunity in local communities, providing the literacy and technical support that businesses are going to need to survive. Look, unfortunately, politics got in the way of good policy. Um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats voted, every single one of them voted no on a relief package that would have provided this additional round of PPP funding alongside with other things like funding for schools and public health and the postal service. But look, I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and with more support, we can make sure small businesses make it there. We do have a lot of work to do to defeat the virus and to ensure that our small businesses have a equitable, fair and sustainable recovery. And I'm confident that your organization, along with many like yours across the country, I know are gonna play an incredible and important role in that effort. So I wanna thank you for everything you're doing and for the chance to bring you up to date on all this. And I look forward to being in person with you very soon, maybe as early as next year, when we're all vaccinated and immune. So stay safe, everyone. God bless and thank you. Hey, everyone. It's all right. Thank you, Nancy, for navigating that uh, those video messages. And I think all of you uh, feel the same way I do. That's uh, to have that kind of optimism and to have that kind of leadership and from our state uh, in Washington, D.C. right now is so crucial. And um, so we are so appreciative to Senators uh, Scott and Rubio uh, for their uh, efforts and their presentation and participation today. And now, uh, again, following up on the Washington, D.C. Uh, circuit, we have with us Jack Howard. And he is Senior Vice President of Congressional and Public Affairs for the U.S. Chamber. He oversees a team of 15 lobbyists in Washington, as well as seven regional offices. In addition to the Chamber's congressional lobbying activities, he coordinates their resources around the country. He coordinated uh, legislative priorities for Presidents George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. He's been an advisor to House and Senate leaders and has been recognized by National Journal and Roll Call. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science from Gettysburg College. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Jack Howard. Thank you, Jack. Yep, thank you, Robert. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, you know, thank you for all the support that you all provide to what we're trying to accomplish up here in, in, in Washington. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of, I know people want to talk about what the, the next year and the agenda and things like that. I just want to remind people, we need to finish this year first. Um, there's still several high priority pieces of legislation in limbo, frankly, uh, that we're still working hard to try to get across the finish line between now and whenever the Congress adjourns uh, for the year, which is um, somewhat of a moving target, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, there's a lot of commotion, uh, as we expected. I mean, in some ways, it's a typical end of the uh, congressional session where it's kind of like a demolition derby where Congress tries to finish all the work that it's left undone all year and, 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 and pack it into about uh, two weeks. Uh, that seems to have become the pattern recently. Um, so in some ways, it's a very typical year. But in a lot of ways, it's a very atypical year, considering the fact that uh, everybody's having to operate in this, in this worldwide pandemic, and that is having a, uh, uh, a noticeable effect on, on how, how Congress um, operates. So, um, in fact, I was talking to people on Mitch McConnell's uh, staff this morning, leadership staff, uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell, just to try to get my bearings in terms of where some of these priorities are. And they, they admitted themselves that they were having a hard time keeping track of what was going on um, on a lot of these issues, including the ones that McConnell himself was working on. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of a snapshot for how chaotic things are actually up here. So let me let me just kind of try to capture what's actually happening today and then project out over the next couple of weeks and then into early next year for what people can expect. Um, on the pandemic relief bill, the phase four bill that uh, Senator Rubio alluded to, uh, we've seen a lot more movement in the last 48 hours than frankly we've seen since pretty much May or July of last year, which is um, which is pretty impressive given the uh, how, how much both sides, Republicans and Democrats, had really dug their heels in um, for the better part of uh, last year. Um, so really kind of what triggered all the action was on Tuesday, 
when a group of bipartisan senators, Republicans and Democrats, along with members of what they call the House Problem Solvers Caucus, more again, more Democrats and Republicans, um, who represent really kind of more moderate centrist um, positions. And it's a group that we work very cl closely with. Um, they released an outline of a compromise between the, where the Senate Republicans were on a COVID relief bill and where the House Democrats had positioned themselves. So they came up with roughly a $908 billion uh, framework. And I emphasize framework because that's really all it was, was just a broad outline uh, consisting of various uh, funding totals that they were recommending in um, a lot of the key elements that, that are in both the Senate Republicans package as well as the House Democrats Heroes Act. So it, uh, it, it includes money over $160 billion for state and local governments, more unemployment insurance, extension of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, money for airlines, buses, restaurants, and things like that. So the core elements are all very similar to uh, what some of the core elements are in the uh, in the uh, House Democrats Heroes Act and what the Senate Republicans call the CARES Act. Now, the big difference is the price tag. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was pushing $2.2 trillion and Mitch McConnell was, was refusing to go uh, any higher than $500 billion, um, you know, and for all very legitimate reasons. So that's really what the deadlock was for the rest of the most of the year was between 2.2 trillion, 500 billion. So the Problem Solvers Caucus came out Tuesday, like I said, with roughly $900 billion. It's somewhat of a split the difference. Uh, the House Democrats were indicating they'd be willing to come down to 1.6. So anyways, it represents kind of a middle ground. So, um, and fortunately we expressed uh, support for the broad outline, not you know, not all the details, and first of all, no, there weren't many details, but there are also some key some key things that we need to uh, make sure get included, particularly liability reform. But the good news was that in previous uh, last year, the Problem Solvers Caucus released a plan in September, and it was immediately dismissed by both Democrats Democrats in the, in the House and then Senate Republicans, and so people just kind of moved on. So to their credit, the problem solvers people, bipartisan senators showed up again on Tuesday, released a plan that set off, uh, rather than immediate denunciations of it or ign ignoring it, uh, Senator McConnell hours later released his own slightly revised uh, proposal, a little different, a little more money than what he announced in September, but really more significantly, Speaker Pelosi and um, uh, minority Le Democratic leader, uh, Schumer came way down on their price tag uh, from, like I said, $2.2 trillion and indicated that the $908 billion was the basis for negotiations. And, you know, frankly, in Congress speak, that's a lot of progress. They weren't calling each other names or attacking people or insulting each other or anything like that. They were actually indicating they're willing to negotiate. Uh, and um, so that's what's really been going on for the last 48 hours like any negotiation, it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, uh, today, just in talking to running some traps on the hill, uh, they're really kind of coming to grips with how hard it is to fill in a lot of the blanks uh, that uh, neither one of the proposals really kind of laid out. It's like anything else. Once you take, uh, you know, kind of broad principles and try to translate it into uh, legislative text, uh, that that's where it really gets that's where it gets gets tricky. So we're very hopeful um, and pushing hard, uh, trying to encourage um, you know that group, uh, the centrist groups, as well as both leaderships, uh, to come together uh, on a package and and get something done by the by the end of this year, by whenever Congress decides uh, to adjourn, because there have been several critical deadlines that have expired already. First of all. Uh, the unemployment benefit, uh, supplemental benefit expired back in, um, I think it was July. Um, we were not, we did not support that, but we were proposing a much lower level. But anyways, it has, it has expired. The PPP program expired, I think, in August. Uh, rent evictions expired, I think it was also sometime last summer. I can't remember. But anyways, more uh, debt, more programs are scheduled to expire at the end of the year, particularly in unemployment insurance for uh, gig workers, 
um, and a variety of other unemployment assistance programs. Um, uh, there's going to be other uh, programs that expire for uh, uh, student loan debt uh, and, and more um, uh, rent or, or mortgage ev ev evictions for mortgage uh, payments also expires at the end of uh, December. So we're hoping that that the expiration of those deadlines will be enough of a catalyst uh, to force members to really come together to negotiate a package. And then, of course, you have signs that the economy uh, is starting to struggle a, a little bit because of a lack of stimulus. And then, of course, you have uh, surges in the virus itself. So taking all those things can into consideration, we're really pushing hard to get some version of that uh, $900 billion bill uh, negotiated. And uh, the hope is, the strategy is to attach it to the year-end omnibus appropriations bill uh, that... Um, you know, like I said, it's kind of consistent with previous years where Congress leaves all of its appropriations work until the end of the year and then and then combines all the bills and then passes them as one big package. So that's kind of the that's the broad strategy that that we're pursuing here for the rest of the year is to get that omnibus appropriations bill in shape so that the House and Senate can pass it uh, before the end of the year and then attach some version of pandemic relief to that as well. And uh, if we can pull that off, that will be a, a very productive um, exercise. So that's the idea. We have a lot of work to do between now and uh, Congress is actually scheduled to adjourn. The House is actually scheduled to adjourn next Thursday. They're not going to make that. Uh, the Senate is scheduled to adjourn on December 18th, the following. The following. So it's a very tight time frame uh, to try to get a lot of this stuff done. But it's like I've often said, Dealing with Congress is a lot like watching an NBA basketball game where you really only need to tune into about the last five minutes to uh, really see who is going to either win or lose, because that's really where most of the action is. Um, it's important also, though, in terms of uh, uh, to keep looking forward, not only for the rest of December, but going into next year, to keep in mind some fundamental dynamics that are going to affect the agenda for next year, um, congressional agenda. Um, as a result of the elections in November, uh, Speaker Pelosi is going to be running a House of Representatives with the narrowest margin. Looks like it's going to be maybe six seats, maybe five seats. There's still several seats that are uh, uncalled uh, with the narrowest margin, frankly, since 1919. Uh, so that's going to limit her maneuvering room, frankly, uh, because the other key date to keep an eye on is on January 3rd by the Constitution. That's when the new Congress is sworn in. And I thought they would change it to January 4th or 5th because January 3rd is a Sunday, but I learned today that no, they're going to go ahead and swore, swear everybody in on January 3rd, the Sunday. Um, keep in mind, uh, we still won't know who's actually in control of the Senate at that point because we have the two Georgia runoff um, uh, seats to be decided on January 5th. So uh, it's likely on January 3rd, when those two senators' terms expire, that the Senate will be 50-50. Now, as long as Mike Prince, Pence is still a vice president, that means Mitch McConnell is still the majority leader. So, and that will last obviously until January 20th. So January 3rd um, could be a big day uh, because that's when uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, has to get the votes to become speaker. That takes a majority, 218 votes. And it's important just to kind of keep in mind here that two years ago, she um, won the speakership, but she had 15 Democrats voted no against her, as well as all the Republicans did, as you would imagine. So fortunately, she had a big enough margin two years ago, so she, she could withstand those 15, losing those 15 seats. This year, it's a different story. If you've got a five or six seat margin, 10 of those members are coming back. Now, I'm not saying she's going to lose those. Several of those members have indicated they're going to vote for her. But it's still, she has to be careful. She has to guard her flank between now and, and, and January 3rd in terms of negotiating the deals with Mitch McConnell, because the last thing she can afford to do is alienate even two or three of her, say, more liberal members. So January 3rd is a big day. Uh, that'll be followed, as I said, on January 5th which is um, when the two Georgia runoffs will occur. And it's possible we still won't even know on January 5th if it's close enough 
uh, and they have to it'll take several days to count the votes. It's possible for the first part of January, we still won't know who's in control of the Senate. So this all has, I say all this because this has an impact on the actual legislative agenda, what Congress can or can't do. Um, there are some other key dates coming up that are, that are going to force some clarity. Uh, I mentioned uh, the continuing resolution, uh, keep the government funded, expires on January or December 11th. So between now and, and December 11th, Congress is going to have to pass either a broad, big omnibus appropriations bill, which looks unlikely, uh, or they're going to have to pass a short-term CR. The short-term CR, most people think, means carried over to December 18th. However, there's a growing speculation for a variety of reasons that Congress may actually do a longer term CR and just kick everything over until maybe March or April next year. If that happens, uh, if they do just a short term CR, any hope of a broad pandemic relief bill, including liability reform, is pretty much gone. They'll just kick that over uh, until next year too. So. Um, lots of moving parts to be dealing with here. Uh, that takes us into that takes us into January, where at, at some point or another we're going to get to January twentieth. We'll know who's controlling the Senate. We'll have a President Biden, uh, Vice President Harris, but again they're going to be facing their own very unique challenges, uh, particularly from a historical standpoint. Uh, President Biden is going to be taking office in a very historically unique position. Uh, assuming the Senate, Repub Senate stays Republican, it's worth noting um, that this will be the first time a Democratic president has taken office with a Republican Senate and a Democratic House since 1885, which is when Grover Cleveland beat Chester A. Arthur. So um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very challenging environment for him to assume the presidency. But he does bring a lot of advantages to the, to the job. The first of which is experience. Uh, ironically, we seem to have swung, the pendulum has swung from electing a president who had no experience, President Trump, and frankly was one of the reasons why a lot of people voted for him. We've now gone to the opposite extreme where we're, we've elected a president who has 44 years of experience, uh, and he's bringing that to bear on, on, uh, on that. And just to put that in perspective, uh, Barack Obama was 12 years old when Joe Biden was first elected to the Senate. So I say all this just to kind of give you a sense for kind of the back, you know, the backroom drama and some of the competing dynamics that are going to affect the agenda and how, how President Biden approaches the next Congress, how Mitch McConnell approaches the next Congress, assuming he's still in control. If he is, it'll be a, it'll be a 51-49 Senate for 52-48 Senate if they win both seats. Of course, if they lose, both seats. It's a 50-50 Senate, in which case Kamala Harris casts the deciding vote and, and uh, Chuck Schumer is the majority leader. So fast forwarding through all that drama, um, the agenda for next year, it seems like it's emerging, um, at least in terms of the top priority issues. Of course, ultimately it'll be up to uh, the incoming president to uh, really define that, but we're expecting uh, probably more action on some sort of a uh, pandemic relief bill, particularly if, if, if Congress can't get one done between now and the end of the year. Uh, but I think it'll be blended more with like an economic recovery program with some, uh, some uh, tax provisions and other things like that aimed at helping getting the economy back on, it, back on its, its feet. Um, infrastructure, a lot of interest on both sides of the aisle to try to do an infrastructure bill, but they ultimately you know, it comes down to how are you going to pay for that? And I think it'll be a different kind of an infrastructure bill than what we saw the Congress try to do in this previous session. I think it'll be much more tilted towards including a lot of clean energy type, uh, uh, green climate type type things. Um, but we are pushing hard to get that, that to the top of the policy agenda. We want to try to get a bill signed into law by July 4th. Uh, and I think interestingly enough, this will be where the real test will be uh, of the relationship between uh, Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell. They go back a long way. Um, uh, they both served as a Senate together. Mitch McConnell was elected in 1984. Uh, Biden was elected in 1972. So they have a long history of working together, not only as senators, but also when Biden was vice president. Uh, so that'll be a real, real test. In fact, McConnell 
uh, or Biden was known as the quote unquote McConnell whisperer in the, in the uh, Obama uh, White House. So the other thing is in addition to what will be on the agenda, what's just as important is what won't be on the agenda as a result of uh, the narrower margins in the Senate and in the House. Uh, we're not gonna see a lot of the stuff we heard about during the campaign from the far left in particular, uh, like ending the filibuster, expanding the Supreme Court, adding two more states, DC and Puerto Rico, uh, or total repeal of the, of the tax reform bill. It's gonna be a much more of a centrist type of agenda, which is why uh, we at the chamber have put so much pressure on trying to work with uh, those members, uh, whereas I kind of started here, who are willing the problem solvers caucus, the bipartisan uh, senators who are really trying to, trying to trying to get things done because we think that'll be the kind of governing dynamic for the next Congress. So let me stop there. Um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions um, or provide more information on uh, things I might've missed or confused people on. All right. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Jack. That's a great summary. That's, a, that's uh, certainly a mouthful. We know uh, what's going on and we read about it. But uh, nice to have inside the Beltway intelligence. And um, I want to remind everybody before we go to our next speaker, um, please use the chat room. Um, and we do want to get those questions lined up in the chat room. And we will uh, ask them in the order received uh, at that point. So uh, again, thanks, Jack. And uh, stay tuned as we get ready for some of the questions out of the chat room. Now I'm going to turn it over to David Hart. He is Executive Vice President of the Florida Chamber, where he manages legislative and political operations. Previously, he was Legislative Officer at the U.S. Department of Transportation and U.S. Peace Corps in Washington. He's worked with former Commissioner of Education Frank Brogan, then Governor Jeb Bush, then on to the Florida Home Builders Association. He joined the Florida Chamber in 2010. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Emory University and a master, master's degree in international affairs at FSU. He's also a graduate of Leadership Florida. He and his wife, Jill, have two children, Savannah and Hayden. And uh, now I will happily turn it over to Dave Hart. Thank you for that introduction, Robert. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. I'm going to try to share the screen here. See if the technology gods are smiling today. It looks like they are. Well, I'm delighted to be with the Daytona Regional Chamber. Uh, hello to everyone on the, the Zoom call today and a special thanks to my friends, Nancy and Jim for the invitation. I'm gonna share uh, just a couple of slides to try to highlight um, the results of the election uh, here in Florida, specifically as it relates to the Florida legislature. And, uh, and then I'll quickly dive into the real meat of what I see as some of the big opportunities, big issues that the business community cares about for the 2021 legislative session. Of course, I'm mindful that I'm being followed by our good friend, uh, future speaker, Paul Renner. Renner. So, um, you know, I'll give you my best crystal ball from 34 years of, of, of doing this, but then Paul can come behind me and, and clean it up and tell you what's really going to happen. Let's see if I can get the slide to advance here. So first, uh, let's talk about the election night that we had uh, just several weeks ago now. Uh, we focus our efforts entirely on uh, state level races, be that governor and cabinet in, in those years and uh, Florida House and Senate seats. And uh, really proud to, to sort of brag on our political operations team here at the Florida Chamber, we uh, we raised and spent uh, north of six point five million dollars this cycle, um, and we interviewed ninety two candidates uh, through our Florida Chamber Political Institute. That's seventy four House candidates and eighteen Senate candidates. The result of our efforts of endorsements of um, uh, digital media, of mail pieces, of get out the vote efforts is that 97% of the candidates we endorsed uh, won on election night. 
We've been averaging about 92% over the last decade. And so this election cycle uh, certainly set a new high watermark. What you see there is a, a list of the, in green below, a list of the candidates for Senate and, and Florida House that we endorsed. Uh, we went 12 for 12 in our Senate candidate uh, races. And by the way, you had one of the barn burners uh, in the whole state uh, with Jason Broder's race in Senate District 9, which has a, a part of uh, Western Volusia. And so thank you for sending Jason Broder back to uh, Tallahassee. We love working with him. And that was a big, that was a big win. We also uh, were very mindful that you had a super important and close house race uh, down in, in Volusia County with our friend Elizabeth, Elizabeth Federhoff. And uh, thank you for sending Elizabeth back too. She is um, just a fantastic champion for the business community and someone we love to work with. To drill down a little bit, um, what you see here is uh, if you were Speaker Chris Sprouse, you had a heck of a good night uh, on election night. Not only did Speaker Sprouse defend every single uh, incumbent that was up for re-election in Florida for the Florida House, but he actually picked up uh, five additional seats. And that was quite unexpected. If you were asking pollsters uh, and sort of the the you know chattering class uh, that that pays attention to campaigns and politics in Florida. Most of them were predicting right up until election day that the House um, Speaker would probably see a net loss of a couple of seats, uh, but he uh, he defied the odds and picked up five seats in the Florida House. So the the Florida House is now seventy eight Republicans and forty two Democrats as we enter next session. The Florida Senate um, uh, had really some of the toughest, most expensive battleground races in the state. I think for two years, we've known that uh, Senate District 9, where Jason Broder was, was running for the Senate, uh, and Senate District 39 with Ana Maria Rodriguez were gonna be incredibly expensive and incredibly close, and quite frankly, you know, could go either way in a presidential election year. Um, Senate President Simpson um, and his team, along with those two candidates, prevailed, won both of those uh, critical races, but they also picked up uh, an additional seat that in many ways was quite unexpected. Um, they picked up um, Senate District 37, and Senate District 37's down there in Miami. It's where um, Ileana Garcia knocked off Jose Javier Rodriguez by just 32 votes. And it took uh, both a automatic recount and a hand recount to uh, finalize that outcome. So the net gain uh, is that we now have a Florida Senate that's 24 Republicans and 16 Democrats. Well, let me dive into five or six key issues for the 2021 session, and, and then I'll be happy to take some questions as well. Uh, first, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't lead with the importance of legal reform in our state. It's something we've partnered on uh, with local chambers around the state as, as well as the Daytona Chamber. We're, we're all very familiar with the sad fact that we do a lot right in Florida, but our legal climate continues to be in the bottom five in the country. Some of you uh, will recognize the photo on the screen of our CEO, Mark Wilson, and the governor standing uh, with us. Uh, also uh, a member of your delegation, Tom Leake, who quite frankly has been an amazing uh, friend and leader on these issues during his time in the Florida House. I do think this session, there's an opportunity to uh, move the needle on some legal reform issues. Uh, we, have, we, we continue to see that there's quite an appetite, even at the, the highest levels of leadership, to finally have personal injury protection, auto insurance reform. I think of, of all the sessions that that's sort of been queued up, it seems more ripe this session than any of the previous attempts. And so I'd, I'd be watching closely to see what happens with auto insurance um, reform paired with uh, what's called bad faith. And if we can get that piece corrected, uh, it could, if it's done right, it could, could be um, a significant step forward in driving down 
cost of lawsuits um, and therefore cost of all of our insurance uh, premiums for auto insurance. I also would anticipate that we at the chamber and some of our friends in the legislature will take another run at correcting the attorney fee multiplier in Florida, which is supposed to be rare and exceptional, uh, but seems to have become anything but. Um, and that is a significant cross driver in the system that we aim to tackle. While we're talking about uh, liability reform, I do wanna drill down on perhaps the most important uh, legal reform of the session, and that is COVID liability reform for businesses across our state. Uh, what you see on the screen is a handful, just the tip of the iceberg of firms that are already running ads, setting up uh, new divisions within their firms, trying to attract uh, lawsuits against businesses over COVID-19. Uh, as of yesterday, when I last looked, we already had over 483 COVID-19 lawsuits filed in our state. And you can imagine as soon as the first ruling happens that goes against business, uh, a, a number of law firms are gonna see, hey, that's where the money is. Let's jump into that uh, and uh, line our own pockets at the expense of businesses that have tried to do the right thing all through this pandemic. And so to speak specifically about that, we, we are not seeking any uh, you know, uh, broad, all-inclusive liability protection, anything but. Uh, it is meant to be targeted and temporary, um, and it's meant to provide a safe harbor for businesses that have done the right thing, followed CDC guidelines, and tried to protect their employees and their customers. And if you've done those things, you deserve to have some protection uh, from trial lawyers that want to come add sort of insult to injury of the kind of year we've all been through. And so look for us to be working. Uh, we already are, in fact, have been since April working with Senator Brandis to shape legislation here in Florida. It'd be fantastic if at the federal level, uh, Senator McConnell achieves his goal in any future package but even if we get it at the federal level, states need to still uh, build on that and put protections in place at the state level. And so we'll be working hard on that this session. Senate President Wilton Simpson uh, said during org session when asked by the press about this, that he thought this would get a lot of uh, attention early on and, and that he expected um, uh, action on it uh, pretty early on in committee weeks and sessions. So I'm encouraged by those words. Next, I want to talk about uh, maybe the most important tax issue of session, and that is online sales tax. Um, you all have been incredible partners on this for so many years. Jim, thank you for all you have done personally uh, to work with me on this issue. Um, we've got to get this done. If you look at the map uh, there, what you see is um, the four dark gray states of Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon, they don't have a sales tax. But of the other 46 states uh, that do have a sales tax, 44 of the 46 have now implemented um, sale, online sales tax. Y'all will remember that the Supreme Court passed the Wayfair decision several years back, and that really provided the roadmap and the direction to states that it was um, the responsible and, and correct thing to do to implement this tax. Well, what you also see on this map is there are two states left in very light gray. It is literally down to just us and Missouri. We're the only two states who have not implemented the online sales tax. And Jim, I'm, I'm just telling you, we've built up a, a lot of friends uh, in the legislature that want to help us get it done this year, including the Senate president. Uh, Representative Clemens from uh, the Gainesville area filed the House bill just this week on Monday. So if you happen to be taking notes, it's House Bill 15. And if you see Representative Clemens, uh, please thank him. Um, it's still going to take a lot of work and our combined effort, but I think there's going to be a lot of attention on this issue this session. And I think if the business community and local chambers unite, we have the best chance we, we could have ever asked for to finally get this done in Florida. 
So uh, the other big topic, I, I really meant this to be is kind of my first slide when I started talking about issues, and it has to do with the state's budget. Um, I, I think everybody recognizes that uh, our state's budget, like every state, has been impacted by uh, COVID-19 liability. When uh, the Revenue Estimating Conference met in August, they estimated that our budget was going to be down 3.2%. $3.4 billion uh, in revenue. And so that's a, that's a sizable chunk, even out of a you know, uh, budget that's north of $90 billion, that was going to cause some, some real cuts to be made. I'm pleased to report, and what you can see on the screen there, those three red bars, we've now had three uh, months in a row where we've beaten the revised estimates, August, September, and October. And in October, we even beat the pre-pandemic estimates for the first time. So if you add those three months up, uh, it totals $719.6 million of additional revenue over the estimate. So what does that mean? That means that $3.4 billion estimated shortfall is now just $2.7 billion. So still a hit, but the picture gets brighter each day. And with any luck, uh, with a vaccine as efficacious as we're hearing, as soon as those deliveries begin in the spring, I think you know, it's possible that we'll continue to see an uptick in Florida as uh, the economy returns to normal, as, as more travel and tourism might begin to come back for our state. So, but I think you can anticipate that the budget is going to be an all-consuming issue all session long, uh, how they close that gap. One area in particular that I want to talk about with respect to the budget is the latest estimate on Florida's retirement system. This is one of the few, um, you know, our state has an incredibly strong balance sheet. We are, I'd rather be Florida than any other state because we have a balanced budget requirement in our constitution. We have a two thirds requirement of both legislative bodies to raise any tax. So we sort of have low tax, uh, small government in our DNA, and it served us well for a long, long time. But one area that's been a, a bit of a, a sore spot is our state retirement system. The new numbers came out just in the last week or two, and we now have a $32.1 billion unfunded liability. Uh, many of our legislators know that we have to sort of right size our state's pension system so it, the unfunded liability doesn't continue to grow beyond our ability to pay it off. I talk about this issue a lot over the years and sometimes uh, at a local chamber, somebody will raise their hand and say, so David, why is that even a business issue? The reason it's a business issue is the dollars it takes to, to fund that unfunded liability ultimately are siphoned away from investments in infrastructure, paying our teachers more, uh, funding environmental projects, just a whole list of things that would be, you know, important investments in our state's economy. And so uh, I think we have a couple of champions this year, uh, again, on uh, right-sizing and correcting some of the errors within our retirement system. And, and I, I, I predict this is one issue that uh, will get addressed this session in some way, shape, or form to sort of right-size and start uh, reducing that unfunded liability. And I'm, I'm excited about that. For the long term, it's the right thing for our kids and grandkids to fix it now. So uh, I wanted to show you this slide because uh, in some ways it's very encouraging. We're already back to a 6.5% uh, unemployment. Um, we've come a long way since, you know, unemployment peaked back uh, in the spring when, when uh, we were sort of, you know, hit hard by COVID. And I, I think we crested somewhere north of 11% unemployment, but we're already back to 6.5%. Uh, the trend looks good. And if you look at the, the boxes on the left-hand side, this is the other encouraging news. Florida has 323,000 open jobs right now. I mean, that's a lot of uh, opportunity for a lot of people. 
but we also have 659,000 unemployed fellow Floridians. And so one of the challenges for our state right now is how do we make sure the talent and skills are matching up with the job openings? And because there's that talent gap, I think one of the conversations we'll hear a lot about this session is workforce training. How do we make sure we're giving people the training they need if they're, if they're switching careers from something they did before the pandemic to a new opportunity and one of these new 323,000 job openings. So um, I also wanted to share with you that, you know, I, I went ahead and pulled the Volusia numbers and congratulations to Volusia. You all are beating the state average with 5.9% unemployment. And I know even that probably, you probably feel it back home that, you know, there's still people hurting. There's still people that have lost jobs or lost hours, but y'all are, um, y'all are beating the state average and congratulations on that right now. I want to talk about economic development issues real quickly. If, if you were uh, around the last couple legislative sessions, you will remember that we all in the business community saw pretty hard hitting attacks on Enterprise Florida, our state's economic development public private partnership. And we saw uh, very intense attacks on Visit Florida, that is our marketing arm to market the state of Florida. Uh, not just around the country, but around the world to attract tourists, uh, which has been our number one sector for years um, to, to attract tourists to Florida. And so those uh, attacks that came the last really four sessions on Enterprise Florida and Visit Florida, I think we'll see now because of the pandemic, we're seeing legislators that have a whole new vantage point on the importance of, of those two entities and, and really an appreciation for what we in the business community tried to, to share all along the last four years about we need Enterprise Florida to help um, build up our economy, to help diversify our economy. And we certainly need Visit Florida to help uh, market our state. So I think you'll see a different appreciation for those two uh, entities. And I hope we'll see uh, not just adequate, but but more than adequate funding going uh, in the direction of those two entities. And then last last sector, uh, last kind of issue area I want to talk about is infrastructure. I, I think there's some some big opportunities this session, um, in particular in water projects and water infrastructure. Uh, I think we've had a governor that's led on that his first two years in office, but we also now have two incoming presiding officers in the House Speaker and the Senate President, they're talking a lot about the importance of planning for Florida's water future uh, for, for both quantity and quality, just like we plan for our five-year plan at DOT for our road projects. Uh, for, for probably 10 years now, we've had uh, really uh, terrific investments in our uh, transportation infrastructure, right at uh, $10 billion a year. And uh, I think this legislature understands that while it's a tougher um, budget year than normal, that some investments like our infrastructure, we're wise to continue doing. Um, I do think last year's MCORS project, which was um, laying some groundwork for three new um, um, sort of new uh, corridors in our state, I think that's going to um, be scrutinized really heavily uh, this coming session after all the uh, meetings that took place around the state and stakeholder groups about where would those new corridors go. Uh, so we might be on defense, uh, perhaps on MCORs. Uh, but there's one other area of opportunity I want to talk about, and that's broadband connectivity uh, all across the state and, and including in rural areas of the state. This is something we at the chamber have been have been leading on for a couple sessions now. And in some ways, uh, the uh, pandemic actually put some additional gas in the engine uh, that people realized the importance of that connectivity. And that's the reason I chose the picture of, of the child in the lower right using an iPad. As children transitioned to learning environments from home uh, quite a bit this year, and continue to do so in many cases, uh, that, that digital connectivity became very important. 
And in some parts of our state, uh, being able to connect and talk to your teacher from home uh, was more challenging than other parts. And so we're gonna continue to work on this. And I think we have some champions now in this space uh, because of the pandemic that, that maybe you didn't realize how important it was before. Um, if you're interested in these infrastructure issues, I wanna call your attention to an event we have coming up next week on December 8th and 9th. It's our annual transportation growth and infrastructure summit. You can go to our website to see uh, kind of the topics we'll be covering and the speakers, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, I'll stop there, but happy to take questions if there if there are any, if there's time, but I'm also happy to, to shush uh, Robert and, and hand it off to uh, our future speaker. David, thanks very much. I um, appreciate those remarks. That's uh, fantastic and um, very comprehensive, and it just makes me want to say right now, before we go on to my friend Paul Renner, uh, you know, we are so fortunate in the state to have Governor DeSantis, um, and I hope folks appreciate what he's doing to sustain businesses, period, uh, and our economy in this state. And he has worked tirelessly under, and under a lot of criticism uh, for uh, trying to maintain a return to business safely. Um, and, you know, so uh, anyway, kudos to uh, what the chamber has done. You've been a great champion in Tallahassee to keep um, policymakers focused and, and supporting what Governor DeSantis is doing in response to this uh, unprecedented pandemic. So with that, um, uh, we got some questions for you. So stay tuned, David. We, we, we'll bring those to you as we get uh, through with Representative Paul Renner. Uh, so, as, um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm very pleased to have my friend, uh, Representative Paul Renner, Florida House District 24. Uh, he is House Speaker Designate for 2023-24. He'll chair the Rules Committee for the upcoming session. Uh, he's a U.S. Navy veteran in Operation Desert Storm, a graduate of Davidson College and uh, the University of Florida College of Law. Um, he later returned to public service as a prosecutor. And uh, now for you know, 24 years, Paul has served both on active duty and in the reserves, uh, receiving numerous commendations and awards. So Paul is a, is a local and he's one of ours. So he lives in Palm Coast and uh, we're so pleased to have him on here. And uh, now you all get to inspect his new facial hair. Which, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Texas Representative Renner. Well, Bob, it's great to be with you, and, and um, it's an honor to represent Volusia County and to be with the chamber this afternoon to talk a little bit about both uh, the uh, positive uh, things that are happening in Florida as well as the challenges. And David uh, gave just a great presentation that I was able to see most of uh, just before I came on. And, and you really see, I think, um, and he may have stated this, but the, the benefit of continuing on the course of uh, understanding that free people and free markets create wealth, of keeping taxes and regulations low. And the result of that is, is a resilient economy so that even with the devastating impact of the COVID shutdowns, you see the state of Florida roaring back. Uh, we're not there yet um, until everybody that lost a job has a job. Uh, we don't want to celebrate, but we certainly have reason for hope. Um, David set that out, and uh, and yet we also have challenges. He talked about our water quality, our transportation, how those core issues that are very much on the minds of voters are challenged when we have um, issues like pension, which uh, simply take money uh, that we didn't anticipate and take it away from being able to do what we want to do to invest in the future of our state. We always have to be focused, and it's a trade of elected officials to kind of be trapped in the expediency of today and not think down the road 5, 10, and 20 years. But as legislators, even though we're term limited to eight years, we do have to do that. And I think it's important that we're looking at where our roads and bridges are. Uh, 
uh, 10, 20 years from now? Where are ports and airports? Um, you know, where is our economy? Is it diverse? Is it going to have uh, the ability to uh, respond to wherever that dynamic economy is 20 years from now? And so those are all things that are the big picture uh, of what we do in Tallahassee. And with respect to this upcoming year, a, a huge challenge, and, and it was also in the presentation, is the dramatic drop in revenues. You know, we came into this year in January and February ahead of estimates to the tune of a hundred, couple hundred million dollars. Even in March, when we began to shut down, we were even based on our estimates. That's how strong Florida's economy was uh, by pursuing the policies we pursued and really letting those on this call do what they do best and having the government uh, deal with things that they must do, but not everything they might do. So um, we did shut down. We saw that dramatic drop in revenues. And now that, uh, and thanks to the governor for being um, willing to balance uh, the need to address the virus in a meaningful way with the need to get people back to work, but also to get people out. And, uh, you know, there's a devastating consequence of this virus, not only to those who contract it, but those who are um, losing their job, who are unable to see loved ones, the psychological impact, uh, the increase we've seen in alcoholism and opioid abuse, and it, I can go on and on and on. This has not been a good time for our country and our state, but the good news is uh, we don't give up, we don't quit, and we're coming back. And I, I'm confident that this year ahead of us will be a, a positive one, one that uh, will see our economy continue to grow, but it means that we have to continue to make very responsible decisions at the state level. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got some COVID liability protection for our businesses. I know the speaker has spoken uh, about the, the importance of workforce development, and he's got some great ideas there. I know President Simpson does as well, and I think there's a good synergy between them between the chambers, and I think the governor is, is absolutely on board, that we um, not look just at our four-year universities, but our state colleges, our uh, career and technical education. When we hear from businesses that their main issue, and you hear this over and over again, is we can't find qualified employees, people with a skill set to take jobs that we have today, even in this environment, we're not doing something right. And so I think we need to continue to better align the jobs uh, of tomorrow with our education system and make sure that we're um, looking at it in that way. So do we, do we want to continue, for example, to subsidize scholarships um, equally? Uh, do we equally subsidize a scholarship for a Florida student to be a civil engineer, which we know leads to a productive career, uh, in the same way we would uh, subsidize a degree that um, really has very little prospects for employment. I think we would need to take a hard look at that and, and let the market um, play a little bit more into uh, these decisions um, so that we're encouraging people uh, with our dollars to find jobs that will fill those jobs, that will give them a meaningful life and not a boatload of debt, which many college students do experience. Uh, the speaker's also spoken recently at organizational session, and David alluded to it, at the importance of flood mitigation, at the importance of addressing um, any sea level rise. You know, in a state that's a peninsula, we're surrounded by water, we're low lying. Um, you know, here in North Florida, we have it a little bit better, but in some areas of the state that are very, very much at sea level, you know, they've seen uh, issues in this regard. And so we have to address that. Uh, we have to always, again, just to end where I started, be forward looking and look ahead with millions of new Floridians coming into the state at where we're going to be in terms of our infrastructure, our education, our health care, all the issues that we deal with at the state level and do that, make those investments while not raising taxes and allowing the market and allowing the private sector to generate the revenues to do what government must do and not simply what it might do. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Representative Renner. And again, this is just, it's so obvious to all of us who know you and appreciate you, uh, but uh, we are fortunate to have your leadership in Tallahassee and um, uh, along with Representative Leake and, and, uh, and others in our uh, delegation, Elizabeth Federhoff, um, you know, and making sure that we kind of keep on course. Um, you know, nobody saw this one coming uh, this time last year and here we are, but, um, you know, uh, we're fortunate to have your leadership at the helm as we as we move forward. 
So listen, this is the time uh, where we get to ask the questions that have been queuing up in the chat room. And so hopefully everybody can hang with us here uh, because they're great questions and I'm, I'm uh, more eager to hear the answers. So uh, the first one uh, for Jack, um, do you anticipate a major relief package for the airline industry? And what do you see for prospects for international travel in 2021? Uh, especially given where Florida is in our local economy on international tourism. Is that for me? Sure, that's for Jack. Um, is Jack still on, hopefully? No, maybe not. Bob, it looks like he uh, had to sign out. So if uh, was that Representative Renner wanted to take a stab at that one? Well, I can only say that it's not really going to be a state issue. It's going to be federal. Uh, I know that they're, that's an industry that really is in harm's way. And, um, you know, boy, I, I don't like bailouts very much, but this is a unique situation where it was nobody's fault. They didn't make bad decisions. They didn't make bad investments or lie to investors. I mean, we just simply – put them out of business for a period of months and, you know, until confidence returns with a vaccine and people not, you know, dying and not being even hospitalized, it's going to be challenging for people to have the confidence to, to return to travel. I do think our, our tourism industry, and this goes, relates to travel in, in the air, airline industry in Florida and the airports in Florida. I think once we get to that point where people feel like, okay, um, if, if, you know, I get this, it's more, it, it becomes more like the, the flu where I'm not going to be hospitalized. I can be treated. Then I think you'll see a real uptick in tourism here in Florida, where I think there's going to be some long-term overhang is in business travel where, where businesses frankly have decided that they don't need to go all over the country for meetings. They can do what we're doing right now in a zoom call or, or a, a different uh, competitor and accomplish what they need at a great cost savings. And, and so that's a challenge because a lot of those seats that are high revenue uh, are those first class seats those business travelers. And, and I don't know that that bounces back right away. Yeah, maybe David, you could uh, comment on that from the chamber's uh, perspective, Florida chamber's perspective. Sure, thanks, Robert. I, I, I agree with what Paul said. It's a, you know, it's a federal issue in terms of any sort of uh, funding package, and so I, maybe I'll I'll set that aside for a second and talk a little bit more about you know we've seen uh, Governor DeSantis just in the last week um, talking about the importance of Florida's international tourism and looking at ways uh, we as a state might be able to jumpstart uh, the international travel from Brazil, for example, uh, which is such an important market for South Florida in particular. Um, but I also think as soon as we begin to see that vaccine delivered in, in larger quantities this spring and people get comfortable that um, you know they can be tested on the front end of a flight, on the back end of a flight, um, I, I'm hopeful that there's pent up demand and that Florida is one of those first places that people say, you know what, honey, we haven't been anywhere in two years. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's go to Florida. And I, I think we will see that. I think we'll see some of that even this winter, just like we would in a normal winter where people are, you know, feeling trapped uh, in, in their home state and they're under 20 inches of snow and they're seeing pictures of our palm trees and our beaches and saying, I, I got to go down there. <laughs> I think that's a very good point. I think it's like, uh, you know, that corked bottle of champagne. Uh, when, when there is some relief, um, I think we're gonna see a big boom in our tourism industry. So fingers crossed on that. Um, this, this might be something you can touch on, Dave. It's probably more of a, a uh, uh, US chamber question, but let me, let me throw it to you uh, right now. Does the chamber support the 160B for state and local governments? Uh, would it be allocated on a population basis? Do you know anything about that issue? If if it's if that's the funding to um, to use the phrase some people have used to bail out state and local governments that have seen a decline in their revenues, uh, I would tell you that I I'm not sure every chamber is in agreement on this issue. My my recollection is that the U.S. Chamber and I I I'm hesitant to speak for Jack. I wish he was still on, but I feel like I remember being on. Uh, some calls or seeing some emails from them in, in support of that as part of a broader package. I think it has a different look when you live in Florida, like all of us do, where our state government's incredibly responsible, has a balanced 
budget as part of our constitution. And so, of course, uh, you know, it, it's challenging for us to say, yeah, we support bailouts to these governments that were on spending and taxing binges for decades uh, that we want to bail them out with our tax dollars. I, I don't, I personally couldn't support that. And we've talked about it here at the, the Florida chamber. And when we've written uh, the Florida delegation about different COVID packages, we have, uh, you know, we've not been supportive of that component of the, the package to bail out other state and local governments around the country. And I think so. David, you, you, yeah, you commented on the pension situation. And I think if you do just a simple comparison between the pension liabilities that we have in the state of Florida to those that are in California, uh, right. you know, just take a look at what they're dealing with versus what we have in Florida or Illinois. Um, and uh, you know, you'll be thankful to be living in the sunshine state. Um, California's, California's, Robert, is in the hundreds of billions of unfunded liability. And so we, look, we are incredibly responsible by comparison. <laughs> Absolutely right. But, uh, you know, still an issue for us. But again, by comparison, and, and if you listen to some of the rhetoric and some of the um, decisions made in, in Illinois and in California, um, again, it, it's just hats off to our leadership in the state of Florida uh, and particularly to our governor. Uh, yes. I'll throw this one to you, uh, Representative Renner. Um, this is a pretty broad question, but uh, probably might have gone to uh, Senator Rubio or Senator Scott, but uh, with your past background in military service, do you see any new conversations concerning the drawdown of military forces overseas? Um, you, you know, I think uh, you've asked specifically about overseas. I, I don't know. I, I, I suspect that um, uh, a Vice President Biden administration is going to put the brakes on that um, in terms of drawing down our troop levels overseas. If you're mentioning specifically Afghanistan, you know, that we're, we're largely in that direction already, but I'm thinking more of Germany, you know, our, our uh, presence within NATO. Um, I think the president was on the right, President Trump was on the right track. Um, we fund our military at a much higher level than the European nations, uh, and they have a responsibility to, to provide for their own defense and not let us subsidize them so they can spend money on all that infrastructure we talked about earlier today for their country. Um, here, here in the country, you know, there's the BRAC, and I, I suspect we're due, I think we're due for another round of base closures around the country. Those bases do proliferate for political reasons. They're not always, you know, based in, in military necessity as much as they are, you know, who's the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. And so those are ways to save money that do make sense sometimes. And so I think we may see another round of, of BRAC, of uh, reduction. And so Florida has done well there. We've got a group that actually is looking ahead and the legislature has helped fund things like buying adjacent property. So there's not issues when they look through the criteria of what basis to close that may be too close into a high density area if it's an airfield. Florida has done a good job of being a beneficiary of reaping additional uh, mission sets because we've been smart about planning ahead uh, to defend against redu base reductions. We've actually been the beneficiary of some of those consolidations, and I hope that will continue, including if we were to bring troops home from overseas and uh, put them in some of our great bases around the state. Great. Thank you. Uh, this was for David. Hey, Bob. And another question for you. This is um, if... Uh, this is from me, so I can just say it. Um, but I was looking back to data in the elections since 2000, and it was my uh, prediction that whoever won Florida was going to win the national election, because that's the way it had been since 2000. Uh, Florida basically has decided uh, every uh, presidential election since 2000. Uh, we know what happened in 2000 in Florida, but, uh, and we need no reminder there. Uh, this year, uh, President Trump actually performed better. The Republican Party uh, performed better um, across the board in the state of Florida, um, yet uh, things went differently uh, nationally. And maybe you could comment on that. Sure. Me, Bob. Um, sorry, was that for Paul? David or Bob? 
or me? Or me? Uh, that's for David. Paul might have some uh, thoughts as well, but um, so I will tell you that I was right about Florida in 2016, in spite of the fact that our own poll here at the Florida Chamber uh, showed Hillary Clinton winning Florida. And Marion Johnson and I, who many of you know, sat in her office the night before the election and compared notes and checked our guts and said, what do you think? And we both said, we think our poll's wrong. We think there's a lot of voters out there that are going to vote for Trump that aren't willing to tell a pollster that. And so uh, we were right about Florida in 2016, but what I was wrong about in 2016 was the blue wall. I didn't expect Trump to uh, break into those states in the industrial Midwest. I didn't expect them to win Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin uh, back in 2016. So I predicted he'd win Florida, lose the general, and, and I missed it. Uh, this time, I, I would tell you that I, I think I got both parts right this time. I thought he would win Florida. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't feel that way the whole time. My, my, um, my gut started changing those last two weeks. I could sort of feel the momentum. And in particular, I was hearing a lot coming out of Miami that they were just, that the Hispanic base uh, and Cuban Americans in particular were on fire uh, for Trump. And a lot of it had to do with the issue of, you know, many of, of, of those uh, who left home countries in Latin America left them because there were socialists or communist takeovers and they didn't want that to happen in their new country. And so to the degree that they were concerned about some of the more um, left-wing elements of the Democrat party, they re really rallied in South Florida uh, towards Trump. So we thought Trump was gonna win Florida but I actually did think Biden had a better shot in the in those former blue wall states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wyoming, and it turns out he did. Yeah, thanks. I hope that answers. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's good. And maybe uh, uh, Representative Renner can follow on to that. If you have any other comments. Well, I would just say to not be non-repetitive is that I did find it peculiar because we didn't win Florida. You know, I think President Trump won by 100 and I want to say 113,000 or so votes and 16 and uh, just south of 400,000 this time around. So not twice as much, but three times the margin. So I found it um, quite peculiar that he, he did so well and didn't really, you know, kind of sweep the nation. Um, but, but David's alluded to perhaps Joe, uh, Joe Biden performing better in, in those uh, Midwestern states. Um, you know, in Florida, we had a very, very good night. We had candidates that won by uh, 30 votes in 2018 that were winning by 10, 11,000 votes. And not just in Miami, where there very much were all the things that David described, but also Broward County, uh, Palm Beach County, uh, places that are tough to really explain. And so there's definitely uh, there was definitely a very, very strong, I'll call it a red wave, because that's what it was. We picked up five seats in the House. Uh, we held two very competitive Senate seats and won one that nobody at all really expected us to, to honestly win uh, by a close margin, but, but won a seat in the Senate as well. And so it was, from a Republican standpoint, a con incredibly good night in the state of Florida. Yeah, it's interesting uh, when you think about uh, that, that red wave, not just in Florida, but picking up the houses, uh, the seats in the House of Representatives, uh, U.S. House of Representatives. Right, um, right. And again, it seems like uh, the presidential election kind of uh, just missed. Um, so, but it, it sort of seemed to go against um, traditional trends. Uh, but anyway. Be that as it may, um, I, David, this is just a, a red flag, I guess, uh, for you to uh, consider, but um, there's a growing concern among early learning advocates on the effects that the minimum wage amendment will have on quality providers. The average hourly wage of a preschool teacher is $10 an hour without increases to the BPK, uh, base student allocation and school readiness reimbursement rate, quality providers will be extremely stretched to keep pace with the mandatory increase. Most providers are small businesses that serve a critical function in our economy. So maybe, uh, maybe some commentary on that uh, red flag. Yeah, th I, thank you, Jason, for that comment. I, I'm incredibly sympathetic um, to your situation, but I, I'll put it in a broader 
context because early learning advocates, of course, those are small businesses, but this is going to impact all businesses in Florida, small and large, and it's going to impact them for, for quite a while because the way this amendment works is uh, it'll start at $10 and it'll go up a dollar a year for five years running from 2021 to 2026. And then at, at 15, it will still continue going up at the uh, cost of inflation. So we're going to have the highest minimum wage in the country. And the Florida Chamber opposed this uh, from the beginning. And, and the reason we did is we knew that it was going to have harmful effects. And in some cases, harmful effects on the very people that its proponents said they were trying to help. Now, what do I mean by that? So for every person who actually does see an increase in their take-home pay, there's going to be a fellow employee that might lose their job entirely or might lose uh, hours, right? Because small businesses can't just print money down in their basement if they've got X amount to, to work with to pay their staff and they've got 10 employees and suddenly they got to pay them all $15 an hour, they probably look around and realize, you know what, I'm going to have to do this with nine employees instead of 10 somehow or I'm gonna to have to cut four or five employees hours from 40 a week back to 30 a week. So we've seen estimates that Florida will lose several hundred thousand jobs because of this amendment. And um, I'm just so disappointed that it passed, but I do wanna point out that while it does take 60% plus one to pass in Florida, which was an initiative the chamber led years ago, this one only passed by less than 1% of what it needed to pass, meaning it passed with 60.8%. And it only passed in 10 out of our 67 counties. So we're stuck with it for a while, but I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give some praise and thanks to Paul Renner because Paul Renner has been a champion uh, and a partner with the Florida Chamber to protect our constitution from things just like this where, you know, sometimes billionaires with their own personal agendas and sometimes even from out of state try to impact our constitution and how we want to govern our, govern ourselves in Florida. And Paul, I just can't thank you enough for what you've done the last few sessions to try to protect our state. You know, I think uh, Representative Renner was probably a lot more diplomatic about his uh, um, opinion about this amendment than I was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, fortunately, I had Nancy Kiefer to uh, edit and and uh, uh, formulate our position. But yeah, it's it it is a, a really a disaster. And um, but I I think there are things that we can do, uh, including maybe uh, another referendum. Uh, similar to what happened with school size, uh, classroom size uh, that was put into our, our constitution as well. So anyway, I think there's there's probably room in the future. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it uh, and conclude the program and go to kind of final remarks. But I just want to first thank uh, David Hart uh, and Representative Paul Renner uh, for sticking with us and for your insights. This has uh, been a tremendous program and we appreciate uh, everything that you offer and do for us. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to conclude and turn it over to our president and CEO, uh, Nancy Kiefer. Thank you, Bob. You know, as always, you do such a tremendous job uh, sharing your insight as a wonderful leader for our community as well. So we do appreciate that. Uh, you did some of the thank yous, obviously, to Representative Renner and my dear friend, David Hart at the Florida Chamber, and um, that chamber is some of the best leadership in, in the nation. So please extend my thanks to everybody there, including uh, Mark Wilson and the whole team. Uh, we can't have a better relationship than we do. Uh, it, we work hard together. I will share with you that on that um, referendum though, that Volusia County did um, not pass it. Um, and I do think it's because of the hard work of, of our chamber and those people uh, that really express the importance of the polls and how that would impact our small businesses. So I think that that's important to say. Uh, we apologize, uh, Jack kind of got booted out either in video or on phone, but he did answer his questions in the chat room. And again, if anybody has further questions, we're more than happy to get the answers for you. There's some staff members still on the, uh, the, on the call as well. Uh, again, to Kevin at AT&T, Scott with Teledyne Marine and, and Jamie at the News Journal, we can't do this without all of your support. 
Um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize at least one of my colleagues who's hung with me the whole time, and that's Debbie Connors from the uh, Port Orange uh, South Daytona Chamber. I appreciate her being on the call today as well. We have a wonderful consortium of chambers working on behalf of business. So thank you all for your time. I hope you got value out of the information and you see why we consider ourselves to be a chamber of influence when we can have this kind of programming brought to us uh, right here for you to have more tools in your toolbox. So thank you. And I look forward to uh, hopefully a more normal year in 2021.